protecting your assets from ransomware. And I pivoted a little bit on my topic, uh, only in the sense that uh, I, it's becoming more and more of a problem uh, for enterprises, um, especially in today's day and age where criminals are getting smarter, right? So I did a little pivot, that's why the topic is a little vague in the description. Um, because I like to do, I like to talk about something at this event um, that is fresh and is on people's minds. If it's not, it's going to be after this presentation, I can tell you that much for sure. Um, but I also, um, I, I have a customer of mine who is not in this area, so hopefully that doesn't go too far. Uh, but I have a customer um, that unfortunately experienced a uh, ransomware attack, um, and it was immensely devastating their business. They are still in business but it was immensely de devastating. And based on um, their experience, I sort of kind of looked at you know, this topic very differently um, than I've done in the past. So um, this presentation, I, I, I've literally been changing it just because it's still evolving <laughs> uh, in terms of the customer. So brief summary right there, what we're gonna cover. Um, I'll do the uh, quantum pitch so I get paid. Um, so we're quantum. Uh, we do storage. You can all read the slide. You're all going to get the slide later. Um, there we go. Uh, our mission, our new marketing materials, we make the world happier, safer, smarter. It sounds corny, but it's true. We like to pride ourselves as being the best company that you probably don't know about, which is good for our competitors, but it's, it's good for us too. So. Um, with that, you know, there are bad people out there, all right? We, we all know that. Um, you know, what do they want? They want your data. You know why they want your data? Because they can get your money. And there are absolutely staggering statistics, which I will, uh, I'll put in the notes so you can read some of these statistics that I have, because I'm not going to just show you statistics all day long. But the, the numbers are absolutely mind-boggling when you look at this. So if you remember sort of the evolution of bad people in terms of technology, you know, we all started with these pop-ups. You remember pop-ups, right? They were awesome. Some of us have seen that on their screen, right? Well, you know what? I'd gladly take those back again to just not have to deal with all of this. It was the viruses. It was adware. It was spyware, right? Stealing your information, spying on what you're doing, right? Then it was malware, and malware is a very generic topic for something that's doing something that's not what it's intended to do. Um, and ransomware is the new one, which is actually a subset of malware, but I'm gonna focus today on, on ransomware, and as it pertains to storage. So with that, um, you know, there's the definition. Basically, it is, there's, there's two types uh, of, mal of um, ransomware. One is A, they encrypt all your data, so you have to pay them to get it back. Or, as of when it first started, it was, hey, I encrypted all your data and you're just in trouble. They quickly moved beyond that because they said, well, wait a minute, people will pay for their, to get their data back. And what we saw at the beginning of, of ransomware um, was they were asking for astronomical amounts of money, right? They, they were targeting home users um, and they were, you know, you need to pass $50,000 to get your data back. And you're like, it's pictures of my kid, I got it on iCloud, big deal, it ruins my day, but I'm not paying. So effectively, <laughs> what they did is we saw a huge shift um, from the normal sort of going after home users to deliberate targeted attacks on businesses. And I mean, the hackers, I will call them, the bad people, um, they literally study your business and they go after what they feel is the weakest link. It is, it is a big shift. Um, and I mean, this is a multi-billion dollar industry and I'm calling it an industry which is not doing it justice. This is not an industry, it's a criminal enterprise. Um, but they're absolutely targeting people and the, the biggest thing I can say is everyone in this room is absolutely the target. You are somewhere on someone's list. Now, hopefully, you just stay a target and you're never a victim. Um, but realistically, what, uh, what studies have shown is that uh, typically, 
when they target a business and if they're actually successful, they found that most businesses will actually pay. They'll actually hand over some money. And what they've done too is instead of demanding, you know, $5 million, they'll pick a smaller amount that they know that you can probably write off on insurance or you may have data protection insurance. That's actually quite a common thing now. And because of that, they're becoming more and more and more successful. Well, they also, by paying a ransom, you become higher up on the list of, hey, we got to hit this guy again and again, or, or girl, sorry, not to, not to be sexist, but I'm going to hit them again, right? Because, hey, they figured out this way, let's try to get them here, right? We know they're quote unquote gullible. They're not gullible, they just have paid. So, you know, unfortunately, success has made this a big, big problem. Um, you know, some key stats, I'm not going to read all these, but key stats like 8 billion cost of business is this, and this, this number of course is variant, right? Because if I'm attacked by ransomware, I'm not going to go, well, it cost me this much, everybody. You know, and there's a lot of digging that's been done to get some of these estimates, and, and that's why they're, they're estimates, right? They're not, you'll never know the true amount unless it happens to you, then you'll know that number. But, um, what criminals are doing there is using this wonderful thing called <laughs> bitcoins, right? It's, it's untraceable currency. Cool. You paid me and you have no idea who I am. So on top of that, it makes fighting this immensely more difficult for law enforcement. Because not only can I not trace the currency, they're using email addresses that don't exist, right? They're bouncing off of different servers, right? They're, they're very smart individuals, right? So realistically, when you, look at, um, when you look at all ransomware, it is 56% of all malware attacks, and that, that graph is exponentially going up. Like next year, if I did the same topic, which I wouldn't, but if I did the, next to the same topic next year, that might be 98%. So I'm gonna walk you through a pretend customer that had an experience, and I'll walk through this timeline, um, and, and Mind you, you guys can ask questions at any time. Sorry, I'm you know, a little bit interactive, but not too much. Um, so this customer, um, and, and, and these, these, these times are actually accurate, so um, my timeline is not 100% accurate because a lot of these events happen two seconds apart, so I can't really put that on timeline. But um, So basically, user clicks on an email that says, hey, here's a new invoice. You, know, you need to pay it. It's you know, some number that doesn't sound crazy. I don't have a copy of the email, but it basically says, here's a new invoice waiting for you. Click on the link to, um, you know, pay this invoice. It's, you know, $985, right? So to most companies, oh, that's weird. Let me see what that is. Literally two minutes later, <laughs> the user goes, oh, wait a minute. I need this plugin. I need, I need this thing to view this invoice, right? Because the website that they go to says, hey, you know, you got to download this to view it. Sure. Now, whether that's uh, you know an update to you know Adobe Reader or what have you, user still does it. Now, mind you, they you know having up-to-date virus and anti-malware protection is just one key component. But this is evolving so fast that you often can't protect against it, other than through you know training and other things. But so. User opens the invoice, you know, finally opens the invoice, and effectively by opening the invoice after doing the install, that piece of ransomware is already encrypting the data. Now mind you, it's also going to go out and talk to its now new friends, right? Because it's in your network, it's on a machine. Now this person conveniently wasn't even in payroll. So why would they open an invoice, right? Like, you start thinking about this, wait a minute, that wasn't maybe the smartest thing to do. But this ransomware attack is started, and it is, it is a freight train of disaster happening right now. Now, mind you, it's the end of the day, yours is done, he actually goes home. And in this, in this particular business, they're generally not an overnight shop. They, they're a media entertainment firm. So they, they do their work and they generally go home. 5, 5.30, they're on their way home. So as you can see here, 5.05, everyone's leaving, leaving the building. Just a normal day. Well, by about 10.20 p.m. that night, 
their SAN and their NAS were both fully encrypted, along with 20 other machines. So if you look, that is not a lot of time, is it? That is staggering, mostly because we have really fast machines now, we got fast networks, like, oh, you know, all those things we do to make things better are actually helping, right? So um, IT actually detects they have a problem, imagine that, which is good, right? Unfortunately, um, they didn't detect it until they started getting access denied on processes that run overnight, renders, things like that, right? Everything started getting access denied. Well, that's weird. Nothing's running. Well, no, there's tons of stuff running. It's just nothing you want. So you can see here, you know, about 10 minutes after we get reach full, full disaster mode, they detect it. Um, and they start, you know, removing computers from the network, you know, the, the old fire sale type thing. Um, we keep going, you know, basically they start looking at, say, okay, well, we figured out what happened. That's easy. We got hit with this. They start looking at what's been compromised, right? Um, so the, the key message here, it took five hours to encrypt you know, 400 terabytes-ish of data, which is kind of good, I guess, because that means everything's really fast. But it's bad, right? So the, key, the sort of key message here is like, while you think you are protected, these people did a lot of things right, but they also made some key mistakes. The faster networks, the faster CPUs and machines, the faster everything actually is a detriment to the attacks, right? I mean, it, it helps them. Um, you know, at, in this case, a human was 100% at fault here. It didn't get in because of, you know, if that person never clicked on that thing, I wouldn't be doing this topic. Um, but that wouldn't have happened, right? But they were, you know, absolutely targeted. Uh, they knew how much revenue the company does. They had an absolute ransom in mind, what they were going to hit this company with. And they knew they had a very high chance of success. So, you know, some of the other things, right? No AV on critical computers. Now, granted, I'm not, I'm, I'm still old school. I don't, I don't recommend antivirus on a machine that's connected to a SAN where it scans every file, right? Not necessarily a great idea. They also had no air gap, meaning all machines that had access to the important business critical revenue generating data had no protection on them from the bad people of the world, right? Um, and permissions wise, yeah, they weren't kind of doing, you know, the general rules of permissions, right? Full access to the root, full access to all the storage networks. So what happens, right? Like they have full reign. I mean, take this a step further, you know, a user could delete everything. Remember, everyone goes home, right? <laughs> so shift delete, bad scenario. Now, mind you, it's not all bad, right? They do have a nice automated backup on LTO. Um, as you may know, Quantum is the world leader in LTO technology. Um, and I also told you these guys were a customer. Um, but they also, you know, this, is, this was critical. You know, they knew they had a problem and they asked for help right away. That's, you know, you gotta get back up and running, right? So it, it is absolutely critical that they went and started engaging all the vendors, you know, switch networks, uh, hardware manufacturers, including Quantum, but laptops, you know, like what do you do when you got 60 laptops that are infected? Well, do you start wiping them? Do you, you know? So they started getting involved right away. Now, let's look at sort of, you know, the bad news is out, life's bad, and we gotta get past this, right? So um, you can tell by the title of the slide, it's not quick. This is literally day two, and I did call it day two because it went past midnight. So that's me, that's gonna be day two, through week four. This took four weeks to get them back to a state that was healthy. So they decided to start re-imaging their machines, right? They gotta get machines back up um, to be able to see what's happening. Um, so that's literally 12.45 a.m. You can tell someone's back at work and they're not having a good day. 
Um, start doing the critical systems, right? ERP systems, start doing, you know, billing, invoicing, make sure we're getting financial machines up first, right? Because we gotta be able to spend money <laughs> and get money and do resources and do inventory and things like that. So start doing that, that's pretty quick. You know, they start doing these. Um, they actually called us at 1.53 a.m. Uh, and uh, we opened what we call Code Red, which is an absolute business in dire need you know, of, of support, right? It's the highest level of support you can get. Our executives in, are involved, they're aware of it. You know, somebody called our CEO at 1.53 a.m. and said, we have a new site, here's the thing. So we started looking at it. Um, you know, we could tell easily and, and relatively, uh, you know, this is, a, this is a case where we can look at our system and we can see how many files were changed, right? That's an easy thing. If a file was changed between 5 p.m. and 10 p.m., guess what? It was encrypted. <laughs> it's pretty easy. So they actually um, had about 770,000 files that were encrypted on, on our SAN. Now, I don't have information on their NAS because it's not ours, so I don't have a lot of information on it. And you can imagine they're not as forthcoming about talking about you know, this incident. Um, so we identified these. Um, we did take a considerable amount of time because not only do we be pulling logs, we're also dependent on the client to tell us, you know, kind of, hey, go back in time, let's talk about your work, right? So there is time here that no amount of people or resources can, can fix. As we move along, um, we start looking at saying, hey, you know, you do have a wonderful quantum system. You are backing up to LTO. You make two copies of your data on LTO. So in theory, you have versioning, right? You do versioning. So we know we can go back to a version and restore the data. It's relatively simple, but we verify it, right? Copy two is absolutely safe. We stop operations. We're not writing any more data to tape because we know all the data we have is bad, right? Because this happens so fast, it actually was more than their system could actually write data out. So that's actually good too, right? Because again, if you're super fast, you, you have less of a chance to actually uh, recover data. So uh, roughly um, you know, you know, about 24 hours or so, after the instant, we were already starting to recover data. And we were able to prioritize pulling things back, you know, of, of, of hey, we have to deliver these shots or deliver this content, you know, next week, tomorrow. We started prioritizing that, uh, pulling back. But as you can imagine, it's a ton of data, right? So we started pulling this back. <laughs> and approximately the next day, they decided to pay the ransom. Decision was made, we have to pay. Part of that decision, and granted I'm not the customer so I can't speak fully, part of that decision was another system they use, another NAS they use was not protected. So they had no snapshot, they had no way of recovering the data so they had to say, we need it, here's your money. Now, you'll notice here there is a massive gap, okay? That is a painful window right there. There was so much agony there that I can't even begin to understand. But this right here is the difference between paying and trying to get the data back. Now, mind you, we were still recovering data, right? So they were able to get some things done. But this, this right here is the sad fact of it, because you're relying on someone that stole something from you to help you. And they are not as motivated as you are. So this, and, and there's a whole bunch of steps in here I left out, but there's, hey, yeah, try this script. It'll tell you how many files are still encrypted. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, right? I mean, weeks of back and forth. And so when they finally got the tool, uh, to start decrypting, um, that was, you know, weeks later. So fast forward again, I'm leaving out a few steps. Um, the attack is officially over at this point, right? Because they have every bit of data they can get. They ended up losing about 10 terabytes of data, which is actually, to me, pretty, 
fantastic. I mean, in, in the grand scheme of things, that's bad, but not good. I mean, I guess if that's payroll data, you're going to be upset, but I don't know what data it was, but I do know they lost about 10 terabytes of data. Now, mind you, all of this is about four weeks. So if you think about your business, what would you do in a degrade, in a extremely degraded state for four weeks, right? You'd pay the ransom, wouldn't you? See, makes sense, now you understand. Um, but you know, realistically, some businesses, I mean, this, this, this is the end, right? People are out of a job because, uh, you know, some businesses can't afford to not work for four weeks. Now, these guys were able to do some work, right? They, they limp through. Um, but realistically, when you look at what this cost them, I mean, time is something we all can't get back, right? I mean, you spend an hour working on something and then it gets deleted, you've lost an hour, right? Like, you've lost that time and you can never get that back. And especially in, you know, most media workflows, right? You have deadlines that you can't push. Um, so, you know, like, like these two are huge, right? And uh, ultimately, they had to let five people go. One of those people may or may not have been the person that <laughs> did that. I, I do not know, right? I'm sure it was performance related. Um, my guess. Sorry? Exactly, you know. Um, but, you know, they lost $50,000 in Bitcoin. Sorry, it's not $50,000 Canadian, it's $50,000 in Bitcoin. So it's actually larger. I didn't do the conversion, okay? I'm not, not, not that nerdy, but. It's a lot. Um, they lost three contracts. Um, not to mention how much they had to pay all the staff. Because the next day everyone came in, right? They sat around. IT's going nuts. Their hair's on fire. They're doing everything. They had to bring other people in to help out, right? Because again, your normal staff doesn't have to image 20 machines or 40 machines, right? Like, this is a big deal. Um, and, you know, in their future business, right? Th this is the number we'll never know. How much business have they lost? because now the word's gotten out, right? So, I mean, the true cost of this, again, even if they gave me a number, is absolutely wrong. It's just astronomical what this is gonna cost them. So, now that it's over, what can we do to get past this? I mean, remember, you're absolutely a target. Someone is looking at everyone's company at some point over the next however long this takes, they're going to look at you and they're going to try to figure out how to get in. Now we have, absolutely, you know, we have antivirus, we have spam filters, we have things like this, right, to help, you know, not have this thing not happen. But ultimately, I did a test at my two previous companies ago where I took flash drives and I embedded a file in there on the autoplay that basically, if someone shoved it in the corporate computer, or any computer, it would shoot me an email. It was a simple test. And I took these, I took five flash drives and I threw them in the parking lot. I literally just, <laughs> apparently no one saw me doing this, but I did this, right? So just a flash drive on the ground, right? You know how many emails I got? 25. <laughs> From five flash drives, think about this for a second, that means, not only did someone use it, they gave it to someone else to use. And there was nothing else in the flash drive. It was totally blank, nothing on there. But so it was a social experiment, right, to see if, you know, our messaging had gotten out there. It had not. <laughs> all right? And so at that company, we just disabled all USB drive, you know, all USB ports because we're like, okay, we're done. <laughs> we, can't, we can't get past that, right? It was a training issue, and it didn't work. But honestly, uh, training's huge, right? This attack absolutely started because of a human. You have to train the humans, right? We have to learn, we have to make wise choices. Um, and, and, and absolutely, you know, like this is a must, right? Um, we have to be smart about these, right? Because they do affect performance on storage area networks, but, and on NASs too. So I mean, you know, this isn't, I know this is a real simple slide. <laughs> this is an immensely complex issue to solve. Um, but really, you know, isolation, I mean, we used to do this in, in, in the media and entertainment, right? We had private networks that we ran our SANs on, right? Those machines never touched the internet. 
I mean, we, we did all this stuff. We were good. But now we're bad. We've gotten back because we have firewalls like someone has. But I guarantee you it's cheaper than $50,000 worth of Bitcoin. I know it is. And time and all the other things I just covered. So, you know, we, we got to get back to here, right? We, we need to just take an editing system on a laptop, right? Using Blackbird. Different scenario, right? Going to have different protections on it than... You know, my brand new $18,000 Mac Pro is, that's in my editing room, right? There are different scenarios for different things. Um, this, you know, I didn't, I mean, I could put 50 slides up that detailed every use case, right? But there are, there are pieces of that. And you, you do bring up a valid point. If I'm using my laptop and I'm doing shoots, right, and I'm out, how do you protect all that? Well, yeah, I mean, the old way of doing a VPN, that doesn't work real well because it's slow, right? So there's th that's what I said. This is a hard thing to do, but it has to be forefront. Um, you know, keeping networks separate, right? Uh, it's something that we VLAN off, right? Oh, it's oh, it's got a VLAN. We're fine. Maybe, maybe the next ransomware attack hits your switch. It's got an OS on it, right? That's scary. So you know, these are things that we need to think about, right? It's thought provoking, if you will. And then permissions. I mean, everyone goes, you know, it's not, it's not the Wild West anymore, right? You have to start locking some things down. Um, I see tons of environments that, you know, oh, we, we just have it open because we trust everybody. Well, cool. These guys did too. Bet you they don't trust anyone now. Um, and then, you know, this is, this is funny because this, um, the 321 data protection strategy is something that we've been saying for years. When we talk about corporate data, like when we think about databases, we think about uh, you know backups of email. This has been done for years, but in media and entertainment industry, and in video and rich media and whatever buzzword you want to put in there, we haven't done this. We've kind of just been having one copy of the data, and life's good. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, when you have three, two, one, one, the old one was three, two, one, uh, three, easy three copies of the data. Now there is a cost to that, but three copies of the data, or asset, whatever you want to call it, has to be on two different storage medias, or formats, right? It could be on spinning disk, or some sort of disk format, right? NVMe, whatever it is. But it needs to live some, on some other format. Is it in the cloud? Is it on tape? Is it in an object store? Is it, I don't know, punch cards? Y it has to be something else, right? Uh, and then normally we had a copy off site, but the extra one is a copy offline. Now, these two often co mingle, but having a copy offline means if I am in this situation, I have a copy that can't be touched. Now, off site doesn't necessarily mean offline, right? I can do disaster recovery sites, I can do all kinds of things. So that's why. This only protects against a building disaster, right? Or, you know, the old airplane in a building scenario, or the fire in the data center, or whatever one you want to pick. This covers both of those. So, again, this is a strategy we've used for non media entertainment workflows. But this is becoming more and more of a critical operation to do this now for, for all, all of our big fun files. Now, of course, being a storage manufacturer, we kind of love this problem, but it's not our fault. We didn't start it, okay? Um, but when you look at sort of... <laughs> I did start that one. You're right. I did start that one. But it was a good, you know, now I know. Um, but so when you look at a company and you look at ways of doing this, and this is my two-second blurb on how I get paid, um, is that y you need to pick a company and you need to pick a strategy for all of what we just talked about, the three, two, one, and Quantum can help you with that. Um, most commonly, we do a lot of, a lot of LTO tape in, in media entertainment. It's easy to do your offline copy. A tape is in, our, is in a library or it's taken off site. You can easily do the two ones at the end with that scenario. But you can also handle other workflows along with that too. In fact, even, even, doing, um, even doing remote work, you can make two copies of the data with uh, a removable 
uh, storage device. It, it's not hard to do this data protection in any sort of scenario. Um, when we look at the common workflow here, there's my air gap, right? It's got to be there. That, that, that air gap has to be there in between here and here or here and there because I'm only as good as my, my last backup or my last archive. I'm, that's my last line of defense. And unfortunately, most people treat this as not as important. They're just not, they're just not worried about it, and you need to be. I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm not trying to, you know, make you run home and cry, but this needs to be on the forefront because I don't want anyone to experience that. I mean, like, there was real agony and pain with this customer, and I like you guys. I don't know all of you, but I like you. I don't, don't wish that on them. Maybe, maybe Paul. Um, so, you know, you have to have an air gap. You have to have an air gap. And, and, and at least and at least your data protection piece, right? We all know the workflow. I don't have to explain this, but you have to have that air gap. That's the biggest thing. Um, yeah, sorry. Those are, the, those are the slides that you can read later. Um, and I, I, I do want to focus in on tape because tape is still the cheapest way to store any amount of data over its life cycle. And, you know, literally, we are air gapped. <laughs> when, it, when, it's sitting, when it's sitting in a slot, this is a tape library, by the way, if everyone doesn't know that. When it's sitting in a slot, and that's the drive, what's in between? Hey, look at that. One guy, one guy got it. Um, no, but it's, it's true air gap, right? I mean, just having a tape library, there is an air gap there, okay? So tape is the most cost effective. It can be designed to be as fast as you want. And of course, it gives you, um, it gives you both offline and air gapping in sort of one box. That's why it's highly used. And that's all I had for you today. Questions? Okay.